experience the awe and mystery which reaches from the inner mind to the outer limits. a visitor. reported seeing unidentified flying objects around there since the 1940s. In 1959, the Reno Evening Gazette published the story, More Flying Objects the Seen in Park Sky. Area 51 is famously known for the alien conspiracy theory that involves a UFO that crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. Jacobson cites an anonymous source who gave her a surprising explanation. Stop All of Us event slated for late September, in which the Post declares, we can move faster Quote, than their bullets. Any attempt to Let illegally access military installations or military training uh, areas the Nevada is desert dangerous. continues to attract those who believe, seriously or not, that Area 51 houses crashed alien spacecraft and their occupants. Very, very great honor. It's a great honor. That's a beautiful flag, too. has recently made public Project Blue Book, an archive of UFO reports and investigations dating back to the 1940s. The report includes more than 12,000 sightings made by military members. Uh, President Obama says that there is footage and uh, records of objects in the skies, these unidentified aerial phenomenon. And he says we don't know exactly what they are.
I was going to start kicking them, but there's a real person under there. Let's give them, let's give them a good job. A big, a big. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Take that with you. God bless you. All right. Everyone stretch out your hands at the alien. Just kidding. We're not the Catholic Church. Here we go. We're going to have fun tonight. This is the final night of our series where I just wanted to do something kind of fun and topical. And what we said is, um, let's have uh, our online peeps submit topics that they want for us to kind of study on Sunday nights. And so you guys submitted a whole bunch of topics. And um, uh, I I thought this series was going to be a whole lot easier uh, than what it's been. Um, This has been a very difficult series. And what I thought I would do is leave the most difficult of subjects. Um, I'm sorry. What I thought I'd do is actually do the fun subject at the very end. I thought aliens and UFOs, that'll be easy. We'll leave that one for the very end. Uh, And then we got to the very end, and I was like, I'm going to be speaking on what? (laughs) I started um, doing my research, and and man, this thing turned into quite the the rabbit hole. And, um, And all I can say is that we're going to need to pray, okay? We're going to need to pray, and, um, and this is going to be good. A lot's going on right now. You know, I, I feel bad mostly for you guys. I mean, think about it. I mean, 2020, um, a lot of you guys weren't able to go to your jobs. Some of you guys had to have your own businesses, and you had to shut down your businesses, you know? And then all of a sudden, um, and you thought it was going to be a short-term thing. You thought it was going to be temporary. Um, and here we are a year later. Where a lot of you guys are actually um, getting uh, notice uh, that you're going to be losing your jobs because you're not comfortable uh, with being forced uh, to receive a spike protein that may or may not uh, change your DNA. So it, it, may, it may not, so many things that we don't know, but what we do know is that uh, many people, especially uh, I chat with uh, uh, nurses this morning at our newcomers luncheon uh, that have just been given their final day of work. Uh, because they're not comfortable um, with receiving uh, 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 the vaccine. And I'm going to put that in parentheses because um, I don't know where you're at. You're allowed to have your own opinion. I'm not convinced. And that's okay. But what's not okay is for the government to mandate this. On top of that, not only uh, did you have a pandemic and now forced vaccinations, but right somewhere in the middle of that was a trillion dollar stimulus put through in 2020 and written into that stimulus package, Mark Rubio, you know, who sounds like he belongs in a boy band, but he, you know, we all know Republican Mark Rubio, he wrote in this bill that the government was going to need to disclose all the information on UFOs in June of 2021. You can't make this stuff up. What is a UFO disclosure article doing in the middle of a COVID-19. So this thing is, uh, is, is just weird. It's got weird stamped all and yet it's happening in our country. And, um, and I know everybody's talking about aliens and UFOs at church. I know this is very, very common. Um, I, I suspect that's why there's so many people here that are not from SRC. Don't worry, I won't tell your pastor. We're not going to be doing crowd shots tonight. We're going to be talking tonight about aliens, UFOs, and the good news. Again, we're going to need to pray. Oh, God, help us. (laughs) Especially help this pastor, Darren Stott. He's going to need you tonight. Father, we thank you that you're not intimidated by crazy. That you're no stranger of chaos. We thank you. That you are a God that brings government in the center of the anarchy. That's why we're here. This earth exists and everything in it. Because in the beginning, you had the audacity to hover in the midst of the chaos and bring your government. Creating three realms in three days and then filling those realms with all of creation. Father, we want to look more like you. And we want to do now what you did then. We want to go into chaotic, anxious, demonic, 
even political environments and bring about the kingdom of heaven. We've been intimidated by things in the past, and we declare tonight we will no longer be intimidated. And Father, we ask that as we study some of this strange stuff that's been taking place, that there would be a significant parallel and a moment of revelation where we each experience an awakening to our identity and destiny in our Lord Jesus Christ. That we would leave here not confused, but we would leave here with a fresh, renewed focus and a vigilant commitment to execute justice on the earth. All for your glory, everybody said. Amen and amen and amen. Sir Isaac Newton, here's a quote from him. About the time of the end, a body of men will be raised up who will turn their attention to the prophecies and insist upon their literal interpretation in the midst, in the midst of much clamor and opposition. We're going to begin tonight in January 12th, 2021 in the New York Post where it discloses that federal intelligence on extraterrestrial technology is now at our fingertips. By way of the Freedom of Information Act, thousands of CIA documents on unidentified flying objects, also known as UFRs, okay, or unidentified aerial phenomena, known as UAPs, as the government calls them, are now accessible via download at the Black Vault, which is a website operated by author and podcaster John Greenwald Jr. Now, the CIA claims that they have now provided all of the information on UAPs that they have. And of course, we trust them. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Yes, the, the CIA has finally given us all of the information on UFOs that they have. And now all of our questions are finally answered. Thank you, CIA. Research by the Black Vault will continue to see if there are additional documents still uncovered within the CIA's holdings. Greenwald promised in a statement on his website. The release comes months before the Pentagon was due to brief Congress on all that they know about UAP. A date dictated in the most recent COVID-19 relief bill of all places, which passed in December. The demands for alien intel became so many that the CIA eventually compiled. Are you, okay, this is so amazing. So everybody's into James Bond. Everybody's into spy flicks. Everybody knows that the CIA, they are like the spy agency for the United States. So they are, they are high tech. So what they did is the CIA put all of the information that they had on the most high tech device that they could come up with a CD-ROM. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if I got a CD-ROM in the mail, I wouldn't be able to do anything with it. I mean, none of my computers even take CD-ROMs anymore. In fact, if you give a CD-ROM to your, to your child, they'll ask, what is it? I mean, that's about, as, that's about as cutting edge as a cassette tape. Obtained by Greenwald and uploaded. So he took the CD-ROM, he uploaded all this information to the Black Vault, and divided it into dozens of downloadable PDFs. In April 27th of 2020, Forbes magazine released an article where they say the Pentagon formally released three unclassified videos on Monday taken by Navy pilots of identified aerial phenomenon, a step that comes years after progress towards government transparency. Finally, the government's being transparent. Thank you, Jesus. Surrounding unidentified uh, flying objects. The videos, which were first published by the New York Times in 2017, show fast moving oblong objects racing through the sky and a pilot in one video yelling, Look at that thing, dude! It's rotating! Okay, I'm just trying to make this like 5% more entertaining, okay? So. <laughs> 
because <laughs> it's all downhill after the shooting up the alien. Okay, the, the Pentagon, which previously confirmed the veracity of the videos in 2019, said it former, for, uh, formally released the footage after a thorough review, determined the videos do not reveal any sensitive information, and to clear up any misconceptions by the public on whether or not the footage that has been circulating was real. Sugoff, a Defense Department spokesman, told CBS News. One of the videos released shows an incident from 2004 in which Navy pilots encountered an object 40 feet long and about 50 feet above the water. According to the New York Times, the two other videos from 2015 and show strange objects moving very quickly. One racing above the water, another rotating in midair. The release of the videos and the Times report on the experiences of the Navy pilots who encounter the objects comes as government officials have sought to investigate and lend more transparency to the subject in recent years. Former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, who tweeted in supporting of the Pentagon releasing the videos on Monday, helped steer the funding of $22 million. Hey, where do you think that came from? Taxpayers. And we probably borrowed the rest from China. Um, a $22 million investigation in 2007 to investigate the UFOs. Okay, just stay focused, Darren. Following the 2017 Times report, the Navy formalized a process allowing pilots to report encounters with aerial phenomenon. In 2019, the Navy confirmed an uptick in UFO sightings. So in 2019, there was an escalation of UFO sightings. Okay, um, They became so, uh, more and more regular uh, to the point where there were so many reports uh, that finally this stuff started being released um, and started becoming more uh, common. It accelerated like nothing I've ever seen, said one of the pilots to the New, New York Times about an, an encounter with the oblong object in 2004 about 100 miles out in the Pacific. President Trump has, pre has previously said he doesn't buy the hype around the unidentified objects. This is a quote from President Trump. I did have one very brief meeting on it, Trump said in an ABC News interview in 2019. But people are saying they're seeing UFOs. Do I believe it? Not particularly. We're going to begin tonight talking about aliens. And then we're going to shift. We're going to go into part two where we're going to talk about UFOs. I'm going to separate these two topics, and you'll see why. Uh, we're going to talk about what are aliens, okay, um, and what to do if you ever see one. <laughs> and then we will, um, <laughs> we're going to keep it practical tonight. We can't just talk about it. We've got to equip the saints for works of ministry. And then the second thing uh, we're going to talk about are, um, are UFOs. The reason why I'm separating these two different topics is because I have two different opinions. These are just my opinions, and they are different. So my opinion on aliens is different to my opinion on UFOs. And let me say that I think it's appropriate this is at the end of our series, because we've been talking about a lot, of different, a lot of different stuff. We talked about chimera and hybrid creatures. You're going to see a little bit of that tonight. We talked about governmental control You're going to, and, and politics and government. You're going to see a little bit of that uh, tonight. We've talked about Nephilim. Uh, you're going to see a little bit of that tonight. As we get into our origin series on October 10th, that's a two-year study going through the book of Genesis. When we get to Genesis chapter 6, uh, we'll be diving into uh, Nephilim, the sons of God. We'll be diving into the watchers, the giants. Uh, so we'll be going uh, uh, deeper in, into that. Um, and so uh, all of these topics converge as we begin to study um, aliens and UFOs. But the first place that we're going to start is maybe the least likely, and that's with the Vatican. Now beyond NASA and ESA, the Roman Catholic Church is also interested up there, in what lies beyond our universe. Indeed, the Vatican has its own observatory in Rome, but Jesuit astronomers are also looking to the heavens in Mount Graham, Arizona. There lies three very powerful telescopes. The Vatican's astronomical institution dates back to at least 1891, and it's already given us breakthroughs, like the first photographic proof of the green flash at sunset. 
Well, to speak more about the Vatican's space activity, I'm joined by the head of the Vatican Observatory, Brother Consul Manio. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's a delight to be here. So what exactly are Jesuit astronomers looking for, and does the Catholic Church actually believe or is even open to the idea of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence? Well, fortunately, extraterrestrial intelligence will exist or not exist, whether I believe in it or not. Uh, we are simply astronomers doing the same astronomy as anyone else, with the difference that we can do long-term projects because we don't have to face year-to-year -year funding. But we don't have a particular mission. We don't have a particular goal we're trying to reach. We are a dozen astronomers from around the world, and every one of us is doing our own particular research project, whether it's the mathematics of cosmology or trying to understand dust that comes off of comets and hits our atmosphere as meteors. Now, does the existence of alien life contradict in any way Catholic dogma? I mean, do you understand that this could come as a shock to worshippers as it affects the, the claim in a way that men are special in the cosmos? Funny thing about that. Um, first of all, it's not going to be such a shock because I think most of us have well, you know, watched enough science fiction that we're used to the idea we're not alone. There was a survey done by the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences that showed that 90% of every religion they in interviewed said finding other intelligences would not be a shock to them. Any, I think the bigger shock really was back when they discovered human beings living in the Americas. And we've gone through that. We're ready to accept that any creature in the universe that is created, was created by the same God who created us, is in the same kind of relationship as the rest of us. Now, has the Catholic Church always been interested in space? And, and is it true that certain medieval Catholic art pieces, for instance, portray uh, things like UFOs? I'm referring, for instance, to the Madonna with St. Giovannino or the Annunciation with St. Uh, Amidius. Um, if you identify these as UFOs, you're putting your own interpretation in what the artist was showing. But you can look at the Giotto painting uh, of the Annunciation, <laughs> of, of actually the Nativity in Padua, with Comet Halley above it. The medieval universities, which is where science got started, had four subjects that everyone had to study before they could go on to theology or philosophy. There was music, there was arithmetic, there was geometry, and there was astronomy. Understanding the universe is important if you have a religion like ours that says God made this universe. And that means we can understand God's personality by seeing how the universe works. Brother Guy Consolmanio, thank you very much indeed for that. Awesome. That is Guy Consolmango. And no, that's not really how you say his last name. Um, but it sounded funny to me, so I said it that way. Guy Consul Magno. Let's go with that. He's the leading astronomer um, who often turns up as the spokesman for the Vatican. He has worked at NASA, and he has taught at Harvard and MIT. And he splits up his time between the Vatican Observatory and the laboratory um, uh, uh, headquartered at the summer residence of the Pope uh, in Italy and Mount Graham in Arizona. Guy has focused his time and his efforts attempting to reconcile science and religion in public forums, specifically as it relates to the subject of extraterrestrial life and its potential impact on the future of the faith. Guy has published a book for the Vatican that was in print for a year before the Vatican took it out of print, uh, but you can find it online. I put a little QR code right up there, which means that if you hold up your phone, It'll take you directly to a PDF where you can read all about what the Catholics believe about religion and ETs. I'm going to read to you a little bit out of uh, this booklet that he published. Uh, extra, and, um, uh, 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 and then I'm going to actually read to you a, uh, an interview. I think I have it here. Uh, actually, I'm just going to read to you a little excerpt from the, from the book. Um, extra, extraterrestrial Intelligent Life. Published, published by Rome in 2005. This is a gold mine for what the Vatican is considering the ramifications of astrobiology, specifically the discovery of advanced extraterrestrials. In it, he admits how contemporary societies will look to the aliens that could be potential 
saviors to humankind. Here we go. Other heavenly beings come up several times in the Psalms. For example, look at the beautiful passage in Psalm 89 that calls out, Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord. Your faithfulness is the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like you? The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it. You have founded them. Likewise, God asked Job, uh, 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 God asked Job in chapter 38, verse 7, If any human can claim to be around at creation, when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy, are these heavens holy ones or those in the sky, the morning stars and the heavenly beings more, refer- uh, more referenced than angels? Or do they refer to some other kind of life beyond our knowledge? And these are not the only non-human intelligent creatures mentioned in the Bible. There's that odd and mysterious passage at the beginning of Genesis chapter 6 that describes the sons of God taking human wives and with it is a uh, a frustrating, oblique reference to the Nephilim, the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. The biblical scholars suggest that the Nephilim and the sons of God in Genesis can be explained away as leftover reference to the creation stories of the pagans who surrounded ancient Israel, that they were written by the kind of people that culture uh, saw anyone not of my tribe as being unexpected Explicably alien. Likewise, the reference to the heavens and the stars singing, praising the Lord, can seem simply for the beautiful poetry that it is. Perhaps it's not so far fetched to see the second person of the Trinity, the Word, who was present in the beginning in John 1 1, coming down to lay his life and to take it up again, not only as the Son of Man, but also as a child of other races. This started to kind of blow my mind a little bit. The first thing that I found out, that, that I felt like was just like crazy, is that the Vatican is writing uh, literature um, supporting uh, alien life, and not only that, but also inserting that when Jesus died on the cross, he may have even died for alien life. Here are some of the questions, and I even found articles where the, the, where the, the, the Vatican is saying that if they do find life on other planets, they will have missionaries that are ready to go to convert those planets. Here are some of the questions that Catholic theologians are asking. Number one, could Jesus have been the star child of an alien race? Was the virgin birth in reality an abduction-like scenario in which Mary was impregnated by E.T., giving birth to the first hybrid, Jesus? Good times. I want to introduce you to Dr. Christopher Corbelli, Vice President for the Vatican Observatory, the research group on Mount Graham in 2012. Again, this really blows my mind that the Vatican actually owns, like, a telescope in Arizona. Okay. Who believes, check it out, this man believes that our image of God will have to change if evidence of alien life is confirmed by scientists, including the need to evolve from the concept of an anthropocentric God in a broader entity. Meaning this, we believe that we were created in the image of God. So when we sing songs like, you're good, good father, it's who you are, it's who you, we think of God, and there's nothing wrong with that song, I, I, just, I just make fun of it a lot, but it's a great song. Anyways, um, when we sing that song, we see our God in our image, we think of him as being a human, and this is what Dr. Christopher is saying, is that if we find out that there really are aliens, these things with big green heads and big eyes and no nose and mouth, we're going to have to rethink, perhaps, what good, good father looks like. <laughs> At the Vatican Observatory, uh, he was the director up to 2015, uh, Father Jose uh, Fuenes, I think I said that right, 
who has gone equally as far, suggesting that alien life not only exists in the universe and is our brother, but will, if discovered, confirm, are you ready for this, the true faith of Christianity and the dominion of Rome. In the Italian newspaper, which only publishes what the Vatican approves, they asked him what this meant, and he replied. Here's the quote. How can we rule out that life may have developed elsewhere, just as we consider earthly creatures as a brother or a sister, why should we not talk about our extraterrestrial brother? It would still be part of creation, and believing in the existence of such is not contradictory to the Catholic doctrine. I'll take you to the um, uh, miracle of Fatima. The miracle of Fatima took place in 1917 when three shepherd children claimed to receive messages from what some Catholic theologians believe was the Virgin Mary. 70,000 people came to the sheep pasture, and people said that they saw a spinning silver disc. The Catholic Church for a very long time would not acknowledge what was happening to the children or Fatima. The children received a telepathic message from Fatima or the Virgin Mary, and they received this message where they heard, you are not alone on this planet. We are here. We have been here for thousands of years. We observe you. And that's not freaky at all, right? <laughs> I'd be like, oh, crap, I'll get out of here. Um, the children were told, please prepare mankind for when we return again. The story and the information went to the Vatican, and the kids were given three messages. The Pope released the first two, but would not release the third message, in which apparently, it's allegedly uh, said that the third message was all about extraterrestrial life. Just going back for a second, the telescope in Arizona, this is kind of interesting. You know what the name of it is? Some of you do. Lucifer. <laughs> now here's my next question. Why would the Vatican own a telescope in Arizona and call it Lucifer? Now let me just say, this was a PR nightmare. Would they think that nobody was going to figure out, you know? So after uh, 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 many, many, you know, conversations and all kinds of stuff, finally they shortened the name to now it's called Lucy. There it is. There's Lucy. <laughs> now, when we're talking about the Catholic Church, I don't want to, I don't want to, the Catholic Church, there's a lot of great Catholics, okay? A lot of great, a lot of great priests. But when you look at how Catholicism was birthed, uh, we recognize that the Catholicism was birthed in 312 A.D., we know that the first century church was under much persecution. And uh, we know that Christianity was an illegal religion. Okay, So if you were sharing your faith, you were breaking the law. And we know that the first gener- uh, century church came under tremendous um, persecution. Um, now the uh, emperor of Rome was Constantine. In 312 AD, he declared that he had a vision And in the vision, he saw the sign of the cross. And in a moment, you guys, the first century church that was highly relational, met in homes, the thing was completely underground, radically supernatural. In a moment, our faith, Christianity, went from being this this organic, emerging, grassroots revolution that no matter how much you tried to crush these guys. They just multiplied. That, that we know that Christianity always thrives under radical persecution, okay? And we see here that the moment that Constantine converted, what was organic, beautiful, and relational now became the official state religion of Rome. 
You went from these guys that were homeless, had no money, living in poverty. That they literally had to sell everything that they had just to take care of each other. That, that was the only way that they were going to eat. And now all of a sudden, you had what was incredibly relational, now, now became radically institutional. And in this launching of Catholicism, you have the merging and blending of the Christian faith with paganism. And that's important that we say because there is a direct link between paganism and the occult and aliens. Number one, I do not believe that aliens are biological entities. I believe that aliens are demons. There was this, uh, this, this guy uh, by the name of uh, Alistair Crowley, and he was an English occultist and uh, came up with his own pagan uh, 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 religion. And um, uh, he was in England doing all kinds of stuff, uh, up to no good. I don't even like to see this guy. I was going to put a, a picture of him up, but the guy is one, one freaky mama jamma. And um, th- th- this guy is just crazy looking. Now, here's the thing. Um, Crowley, when he was in New York in 1917, opened up a gateway. And in the gateway, he had an encounter through his ritual magic where he came, into, uh, 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 he came into an encounter with a being by the name of L.A.M. or Lamb. Now, you've got to understand that in 1917, there were no movies on aliens. There was no consciousness within our country as to what they looked like, okay? There was no, there was no idea that there were these, these big-headed, reptilian kinds of things. So here you've got this, um, this, this witch doctor that goes into a ritualistic seance and while he does, he has an encounter with a being, and he draws a sketch of what this being looks like. He draws up this sketch, okay? And, uh, and I want to show you what this original sketch looks like in comparison with what our culture accepts as aliens today. Here's Crowley's lamb and the alien gray. Up to this point, there's no consciousness for what aliens look like. And isn't it interesting that whenever people have encounters with aliens, they always describe them the same way that this witch initially described them in 1917. I believe that aliens are demonic in nature, and therefore it's interesting to me that um, I stumbled on, I was, guys, I was places this last week. I was down rabbit holes. I was, this was an intense week for me. I, I wasn't expecting it. But one of the places that I came upon was a chat forum where people were talking about uh, abduction encounters with aliens and what happened when they rebuked them in the name of Jesus. Here's the first one. I have had these things, speaking of abductions, since the age of five. I'm now 64, and it seems to have almost stopped with the visitations. Whenever I would get so scared, I would say the Lord's Prayer, and it would stop. I also get abducted since I am four. I am now 23. They manipulated me all my life since when I, I woke up and I saw four of them around my bed. I panicked, and I shouted, Jesus Christ, help me, in German. They started to scream and run right through the wall, and as they ran away, I was like something puts me back into the sleep position, and my cover fell uh, above me. Since that day, I always sent them away in the name of our Savior. They don't come anymore. I will pray for you, sister. I was living in Texas. I had an abduction that was stopped by powerfully saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I was asleep, and I woke to an eerie humming like a fan, a motor, or a vacuum. I was paralyzed. Everything that she's describing is so common in abduction encounters. I've read so many encounters this week from people that didn't know Jesus, okay? And so I was paralyzed. It was levitating off my bed, and my eyes saw a great distance from the floor. I was alone and being uh, sucked or pulled out the French doors. I struggled with my mind to be free. 
free, no use. I said, in the name of Jesus, let me go. And I was free for a moment. I scurried to uh, stairs to get downstairs with my husband. In a moment, as I reached the top of the stairs, I held tight to the railing with both hands. As my legs were lifted off and brought, I was pulled towards the night sky again. It was like being sucked up by a giant vacuum. Then I yelled, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I was free. Back in my bed, it was silent. The French doors were still open. I was exhausted. I ran, down, I ran downstairs. My husband fell asleep watching TV. He heard nothing. He never believed me. I knew since that day that aliens is a replacement word for demons. Uh, e- even this last week, um, like I said, pretty, pr- pretty crazy week for me as far as... Um, just uh, my dream life. And I don't, I don't have a lot of dreams. I dream kind of in seasons. And there's something about the fall where something kind of opens up for me anyway. And I have a lot of dreams. And so I've been writing them down. But this week, uh, they got uh, unusually intense. And in one of the dreams that I had, um, I was in a house. It wasn't my house. And in the dream, uh, whenever I'd turn off the lights, I could tell that the house was full of demons. And I could see them and describe them to you. And there was uh, dragons, like baby dragons, running up and down uh, the rafters within, within the house. It was very, it was very, very quite, quite, quite creepy. At one point, there was almost like a family of aliens, four of them, that were coming towards the end of my bed. And just like in these encounters here, I hadn't read, I hadn't read any of this stuff yet. Um, I, I got up and began rebuking them, and they disappeared, and they were gone. I turned on the lights, and then there on, this, uh, on the stairs was a chart, like a star chart with all of these different stars. And I knew that that was the portal that they had come into the room. So I took that thing down, and I rolled it up, and I put it away. And so um, if you see an alien, what do you do? You rebuke it in Jesus name. Also, aliens or demons, any of these things, they, do tr- they travel through gates, okay? And uh, gates can be opened generationally. Gates can be opened through sin. They can be opened through rebellion against the Lord. If you've had these encounters, you, as far back as you can remember, we can, and we will, at the end of the service tonight, whether it's an alien or a demon or anything else, um, we have authority in Jesus' name to close all those dark ancestral gates. And we've seen it over and over and over and over again. If you're tormented by anything demonic, <laughs> sweet. You came to the right place because we see people get set free every single week, every single Sunday. <laughs> In fact, uh, everybody, it's, uh, it's Roy Simmons' birthday. He's our executive director at uh, SRC, and he just celebrated his first 90 days as our executive director at SRC. <laughs> And I just got just to do a quick rabbit trail, because on his very first day at work, a man showed up here. He didn't know what he was even doing here. It wasn't even on his GPS, but he says, hey, I am here, so while I'm here, maybe you could pray for me. Um, as I started to pray for him, I realized that he had friends, and they were not friends that I wanted to be around with by myself. And so uh, we went, uh, Patty, you were with me. And I didn't even feel necessarily comfortable for it just be you and me. And so we went and got Roy and Corey. On Roy's very first day uh, at work, um, he was uh, holding a man um, by, his, uh, by his arms um, as the spirit of murder came up. And as the spirit of murder came up, he screamed, I am murder! And I said, you know, awesome, nice to meet you. And then he goes, <laughs> and then he goes, and I want to murder. And this guy is a big guy, right, Roy? This guy is a big guy. He goes, I want to murder. And I said, yeah, that makes sense. And, um, and you know what we saw? We saw Jesus show up. We saw that thing bound. He was not able to hurt us. He was not able to hurt himself. That thing came under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he left this place with peace in his heart. He left this place with a smile on his face. Okay, now listen to me. Listen to me. Where we are going, church, you're going to need to be walking in your authority. You're going to need to know who you are, and you're going to need to know how to deal with demons. Can I tell you something? When I first became the pastor here, 
I used to get calls all the time from people whose pastors were incapable of delivering them or driving the demons out of their house. So we're not talking about the unchurched. We're talking about Christians that go to church, but their leadership didn't either believe in or know how to clean things up. And I am telling you, it used to be in the old days you had to go to Africa or India to see this kind of weird, woo-woo, demonic stuff. And now it's here. Third world demonic encounters are right here in our very front yard. And it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to know what to do about it. Aliens are not going anywhere. They're intensifying. Abduction encounters are becoming more frequent and common. The government says they don't know what to do about it. I got a good friend. He works at a, uh, a campsite, and a witch showed up, and she was tormenting them, and there was nothing they could do, so they called the cops. The cops showed up, and they didn't even know what to do. My buddy said, um, she's got demons. And they're like, oh, how, you know, how do you know? He goes, watch. I'll quote scripture and watch what she does. He goes over and starts quoting scripture. She starts wigging out, and the cops are like, oh, my gosh, we think you're right. She does have demons. <laughs> that wasn't in India. That was right here about 15 minutes away. Good times, let's get back to the subject. We see a big thing, a big phenomenon right now in our generation where it's very, very popular to engage with a drug called DMT. We talked about this our very first week. The common thing with DMT is that people are engaging with, you guessed it, aliens. I'm going to read to you um, some stats here. Just over a fifth of people who take DMT have, recor have recorded encounters with aliens. Are you ready for this? That's 21% of participants that engage with this drug actually see these, um, these creatures. Um, sometimes they call them uh, elves or observers and uh, uh, guides, um, helpers, but they usually describe them as looking just like aliens. Um, almost every respondent had an emotional response. And a total of 41% said they felt afraid when they, meant the, when they met the entity. Um, it was interesting because uh, the experiences also changed the spiritual beliefs of the participants. More than 50% who were atheists were no longer atheists after the drug trip. <laughs> and, um, and we can go on and on um, with that. I'm just going to skip the, uh, uh, along uh, for, because of the, the time um, that we have. But we do see that people are using these drugs um, in America and influencers, and we're talking also uh, 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 John Hopkins University uh, has tons and tons of money, millions of dollars being invested into psychedelics um, that are going into the hope that these drugs that open up gateways. Now remember the Tower of Babel was considered a gateway to the gods or the gateway to God. So what they had opened up there at the Tower of Babel was some sort of gateway where they were accessing uh, technology and intel. Uh, it was a, um, uh, you know, an illegal gateway. What, our, our only gateway is Christ Jesus. I could tell you crazy stories with believers that I've talked to, and they are going through counterfeit gateways in order to have spiritual encounters. No, we do not do that. Our only uh, a gateway is Christ Jesus. But right now, we see a generation where it's acceptable uh, to use DMT to access these creatures because these creatures are given out the, uh, what the name of your business should be. You know, you ever hear of these companies, just these weirdo abstract names, and you wonder where they got them? From, from these guys. Even in Silicon Valley, these guys are going on uh, DMT and ayahuasca retreats where they're going and engaging, uh, going through um, uh, gates, gateways to God, counterfeit gateways to God to get technology, to get marketing ideas, and, um, and this stuff is coming from a demonic realm. So I believe that aliens are not biological entities. They're demonic in nature, and they... They, they take off. They disappear when you rebuke them in Jesus' name. Isn't that awesome? We got authority. Now we're going to go to part two, UFOs. The acronym for UFO means Unidentified Flying Object. It was the brainchild of Captain Edward J. Rappelt. Uh, he was the chief of the official Air Force investigating agency, Project Blue Book, to replace 
the then dominant terms of flying saucer or flying disc. In truth, even flying uh, saucers were a misnomer because Kenneth Arnold actually saw a boomerang-shaped craft that skipped along uh, uh, the water and tossed over uh, a, a lake. Uh, we're going to begin, I find this really, really interesting, by talking about Area 51. We're going to be looking at um, uh, 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 Angela Jacobson's work. Uh, I, I believe that's her name. And um, uh, I find this really, really interesting. She recently wrote a book, uh, recently being this last year, um, where she met with um, uh, 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 many, many um, uh, uh, high-ranking officials that were a part of Area 51, some of them uh, breaking out information that was classified that she agreed to not use the information until after they died. So with some of these guys, they've got legal releases to be able to use this information, uh, but they had to do it uh, uh, because it would have been um, a great crime while they were alive. 75 miles north of Las Vegas sits a land parcel in the middle of the desert called Area 51. The parcel is just outside of an abandoned Nevada test and training range where more than 100 atmospheric bomb tests were conducted in the 1950s. Officially, the U.S. government has never acknowledged the existence of Area 51. Unofficially, it has become a place of, uh, associated with conspiracy theories, alien landings, and, a tiny, and tiny spaceships. Um, during the first week of July 1947, in the middle of a powerful lightning storm, something crashed into uh, a rancher's property. The rancher's name was W.W. Uh, Brazil. Brazil loaded the strange pieces of debris that had come down from the sky into his pickup truck and drove them to the local sheriff's office in Roswell. Sheriff George Wilcox reported the findings to the Roswell Army Airfield down the road. Later that day, the Associated Press uh, International and the radio announcer at KGFL in Roswell received a telephone call from the Roswell Army Airfield. It was press officer Walter Hott saying he was bringing over a very important press release to be aired and they wanted to read this uh, press release. Here's what it says. On July 8, 1947, and in the San Francisco Chronicle the following day, many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force Roswell Army Airfield was fortunate enough uh, to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chavez County. The flying object landed on a ranch near Roswell sometime last week. Not having phone uh, uh, facilities, the rancher stored the disc until such time as he was able to contact the sheriff's office, who in turn notified Major, Major Jesse A. Marcel of the 509th Bomb Group Intelligence Office. Action was immediately taken, and the disc was picked up at the rancher's home, and it was inspected at the Roswell Army Airfield and subsequently loaned by Major Marcel to higher headquarters. That was the press release. Three hours after Hot dropped off the statement, the commander of the Roswell Army Airfield sent KGFL a second press release stating that the first press release was incorrect. What had actually crashed on the, outside the, the, uh, the ranch was nothing more than a weather balloon. Photographs of a crashed weather balloon were offered as proof, and the story faded, and no one in the town of Roswell, New Mexico, spoke of it publicly for more than 30 years. Then in 1978, Stan Friedman and his UFO research partner, a man named Bill Moore, showed up in Roswell and began asking questions. It turned out that a lot more had happened in Roswell, New Mexico. In the first and second weeks of July 1947, uh, 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 more than just a weather balloon crashed. For starters, large numbers of military had descended upon the town. The rancher, are you ready for this, he was thrown in jail for almost a week. Some witnesses saw military police loading large boxes and crates into military trucks. Other witnesses saw large boxes being loaded into military aircraft. 
The local coroner received mysterious calls requesting several child-sized coffins that could be sealed. Townsfolk were threatened with federal prison time if they spoke about what they saw. The majority of the stories relayed by 62 witnesses to UFO researchers, Freeman and Moore, had two factors in common. The first was that the crash, which included more than one crash, involved a flying saucer or a round disc. The second assertion was jaw-dropping. Witnesses said they saw bodies, and not just old bodies, but child-sized, humanoid-type beings that had apparently been inside the flying saucer. The aviators had big heads, large oval eyes, and no noses. The conclusion that the majority of the witnesses drew for UFO researchers was that these child-sized aviators were not from this world. In 1980, a book on the Friedman and Moore's research was published. It was called The Roswell Incident. The lid was off of Roswell and the floodgates opened. By 1986, a total of 92 people had come forward with eyewitness accounts of what had really happened in 1947. The War of the Worlds. On Halloween Eve, 1938, mass hysteria descended upon New Jersey as a CBS radio broadcast a narrative adaptation of the Victorian-era science fiction novel, The War of the Worlds. Ladies and gentlemen, the narrator began, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin. A huge flaming meteorite had crashed into the farmland at Grover's Mill, 22 miles north of Trenton, listeners were told. Frank Reddick, playing Carl Phillips, a CBS reporter, claiming to be physically on the scene, delivered a breaking report. The object doesn't look like much of a meteor, Philip said with a shaky voice. It looks more like a huge cylinder. The metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I have ever witnessed. Someone's crawling out of the hollow top. Although the 8 p.m. broadcast had opened with a huge brief announcement that the story was science fiction based on the novel by H.G. Wells, huge numbers of people across America believed it was real. Those who turned their radio dials for confirmation learned that other radio stations interrupted their broadcast to follow the exclusive. Live CBS radio coverage about the Mars attack. Thousands called the station and called the police. Switchboards were jammed. Hospitals began admitting people for hysteria and shock. Families in New Jersey rushed out of their homes to inform anyone not in the know that the world was experiencing a Martian attack. The state police sent a teletype over the communication system, noting the broadcast drama was an imaginary affair, but the hysteria was well beyond local law enforcement's control. Across New York and New Jersey, people loaded up their cars and they fled. To many, it was the beginning of the end of the world. The following morning, the New York Times carried page one. Above the fold story headline, radio listeners in a panic taking war drama as fact. Although, uh, all through the night, in churches from Harlem to San Diego, people prayed for salvation. This thing brought about like a revival. Churches were packed out. People were getting saved. (laughs) In the month that followed, more than 12,500 news stories discussed the War of the World's broadcast. The FCC opened an investigation, but in the end, they decided not to to penalize CBS largely on the grounds of freedom of speech. Remember those days? (laughs) It was not the FCC's role to censor what shall be said or not said on the radio. Amen. 1938, War of the Worlds broadcast tapped into the nation's growing fears Just two weeks before, Adolf Hitler's troops had invaded the, uh, uh, come on, help me, it's been a long day. 
Czechoslovakia, leaving the security of Europe unclear. The science fiction played on people's fears of invasion and annihilation. Man has always been afraid of sneak attacks, which is exactly what Hitler had just done and, uh, and what Japan would soon do at Pearl Harbor. From the moment it hit the airwaves, the War of the World's radio broadcast had a profound effect on the, on the American military. The following month, a handful of military listeners relayed their thoughts on the subject to the Associated Press. What struck the military listeners most about the radio play was its immediate emotional effect, the officials told the AP. Thousands of persons believed a real invasion had been unleashed. They were exhibited all the symptoms of fear, panic, determination to resist, desperation, bravery, excitement, or fatalism that the real world uh, would have produced which in turn shows the government will have to insist on the close cooperation of radio in any future war. What these military men were not saying was that there was serious concern among strategists and policymakers and the entire segment of the population could be so easily manipulated into thinking that something false was something true. Americans had taken very real physical actions based off of something that was entirely made up. Pandemonium had ensued. To tell, to tell, to, I'm telling you, totalitarian nations were able to manipulate their citizens like this. But in America, this kind of mass control had never been seen so clearly in, 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 uh, before. America was not the only place where government officials were impressed on how easily people could be influenced by radio broadcasts. Adolf Hitler was taking note as well. He referred to the Americans' uh, hysterical reaction to the War of the World's broadcast in a Berlin speech, calling it evidence of the decadence and corrupt condition of democracy. It was later revealed that in the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin had also been paying attention. And President Roosevelt's top science advisor, Vannevar Bush, observed the effects of the fictional radio broadcast with a discerning eye. The public's tendency to panic alarmed him. He would later tell uh, W. Cameron Forbes, his colleague at Carnegie Institution, three months later, alarming news hit uh, the airwaves again. But this time, it was pure science. Not science fiction. The nuclear bomb. On January 26, 1939, the Carnegie Institution sponsored a press release to announce the discovery of nuclear fission to the world. When the declaration was made, two German-born scientists had succeeded in splitting the atom. A number of physicists were present, literally ran uh, from the room. The realization was as profound as it was devastating. If scientists could split one atom, then surely they would be able to create a chain reaction of splitting atoms. The result would be an enormous release of energy. Three months later, the New York Times reported that scientists at a follow-up conference were heard arguing over the probability of some scientists blowing up a sizable portion of the earth with a tiny bit of uranium. This is what was terrifying the prospect of the new world. Atomic energy, as it turned out, was far more powerful than anything previously made by man. Six years and seven months after the announcement of the discovery, so this is what we discovered. Check it out. This is technology for you. Six years and seven months later, America dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, essentially wiping out both of those cities and a quarter of a million people living there. President Roosevelt had appointed Vannevar Bush to lead the group that made the bomb. Bush was the director of the Manhattan Project, the nation's first true black operation. As Americans celebrated peace after the atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, public opinions polled show that more than 85% of Americans approved of the bombings. 
Vannevar Bush and members of the War Department began planning to use the atomic bomb again in a live test. A kind of mock nuclear naval battle that they hoped could take place on the summer and, and the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. There in a deep lagoon at Bikini Atoll, dozens of captured Japanese and German warships would be blown up using live nuclear bombs. The operation would illustrate to the world just how formidable America's new weapons were. It was also called Operation Crossroads. And its name implied the event marked a critical juncture. America was signaling to Russia it was ready to do battle with nuclear bombs. To Joseph Stalin, the atomic tests were America's way of signaling to the rest of the world that the nation was not done using nuclear bombs. It also confirmed for the already paranoid Stalin that Americans were ready to deceive him just as Adolf Hitler had done four years earlier. Unknown to Americans, as Stalin watched Crossroads, he did so with confidence, knowing that his own nuclear program was well advanced. In just five months, the Soviet Union's first chain reaction atomic pile would go critical, paving the way for Russia's uh, first atomic bomb. What has never been uh, disclosed was that Joseph Stalin was developing another secret weapon for his arsenal, separate from the atomic bomb. It was straight from the radio hoax, the War of the Worlds, something that could sow terror into the hearts of fearful imperialists and said panic-stricken Americans running into the streets. So what really happened at Roswell? During the first week of July 1947, and this isn't an official photograph from Roswell, this is just a photograph I found on the World Wide Web of dudes with a old UFO. During the first week of July 1947, U.S. Signal Corps engineers began tracking two objects with remarkable flying capacities. Remember, this is 1947. This is the, the Roswell in incident. Moving across southwest United States. What made the aircraft extraordinary was that though they flew in a traditional forward-moving motion, the craft, or whatever they were, began to hover sporadically before continuing to fly on. This kind of technology was beyond any aerodynamic capabilities the U.S. Air Force had uh, seen developed um, in the summer of 1947. When multiple sources began reporting the same data, it became clear that the radar wasn't showing phantom returns or electronic ghosts. This was real. Kirtland Army Air Force Base is just north of White Sands Proving Ground, tracking the flying craft into its near vicinity. The commanding officer there ordered a decorated World War II pilot named Kenny Chandler into a fighter jet to locate and identify the craft. Chandler never visually spotted what he was sent to look for. But within hours of Chandler sweeping the skies, one of the flying objects crashed near Roswell, New Mexico. Immediately, the officer of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or JCS, took command and control of the recovered airframe and some of the propulsion and equipment, including the crash craft's power plant or energy source. The recovered craft looked nothing like conventional aircraft. The vehicle had no tail. It had no wings. The fusage was round, and there was a dome mounted on top. In secret, Army intelligence memos declassified in 1994, it would be referred to as a flying disc, but most alarming was a face kept secret until just recently. Inside the disc was a very earthly hallmark. Inside the crash was Russian writing. Block letters of the, uh, how do you say, the Cyrillic alphabet? had been stamped or embossed in a ring around the inside of the aircraft. In a critical moment, the American military had its worst fears realized. The Russian army had somehow developed stealth, hover-and-fly spy technology. Stalin was able to fly over several of the most sensitive military installments in the western United States. 
Stalin had done this with foreign technology that the U.S. Army forces knew nothing about. The single most worrisome question facing the Joint Chiefs or staff at that time was, what if, remember everything was about atomic, what could you do with atomic energy? What could you do with atomic energy? What if atomic energy actually propelled the Russian spacecraft? Or worse, what if it was dispersed radioactive particles like a modern-day dirty bomb? How long ago was that? 1947. Think about what they could have now. This is from the uh, military.com, talking about the TR-3B. And this is what they say on the military.com. Uh, it doesn't officially exist. It uses highly pressured mercury accelerator. And this is all from military.com, okay? <laughs> it doesn't exist, but if it did, it would use highly pressured mercury accelerated by nuclear energy to produce a plasm that creates a field of anti-gravity around the ship. Conventional thrusters located at the tips of the craft allow it to perform all manner of rapid high-speed maneuvers on all three axes. Have you guys any, watched any of the videos? That's what these things are actually doing. Interestingly, the plasma generated also, to, uh, also reduces radar significantly so that it can be almost invisible. This literally means that it can go to any country it likes without being detected by air traffic control or air defense systems. It doesn't exist. And yet, here's a shot that the Pentagon released as part of its declassification. A triangle UFO. Here's another picture. Now, UFO enthusiasts, they get so angry when you talk about this. Why? Because they want so badly for there to be life on other planets that are getting into metal objects, you know, and flying into our Earth's orbit. Um, okay? So they get mad. And they're saying, no, no, no. These things, these, these things don't exist. Uh, what about the... Uh, the first, the first version, the TR-3A, uh, that was the older version. And these are the things that we know about. These, and, and these are old reports. I believe it's 2013 when they started, um, people started seeing these things, these, these triangles. These, uh, how about 1997? Did anybody see the documentary done on the lights uh, over Phoenix where thousands and thousands and thousands of people reported seeing massive, gigantic, triangle flying saucers that were completely silent. Thousands of people, all, all kinds of people got on footage. This is not, I mean, it was, it was a big, big deal. Uh, and then the governor went, uh, went live to give a response where he made fun of everybody and had an alien on the stage and was clowning around. Um, and that made everybody really mad because you have thousands and thousands of people that saw massive triangle floating objects over Phoenix, over a major city, okay? And these things look exactly like, um, and, uh, and there was no panic. There was no panic. There were no Air Force, uh, Air Force shooting these things down. It, does that make anyone else think something's up? If there were really gigantic triangle flying objects over our major cities and our government didn't know what they were, don't you think it'd be more like Independence Day? Don't you think President Biden would be like, my fellow Americans, they can take our lives, but they won't take our freedom. Like President Joe Biden with his face all painted up. This is our Independence Day, right? right? And I'd be like, let's go, Joe, let's go, right? I, Does, doesn't anyone find it weird that it's the Pentagon that's releasing all of this UFO footage and yet nobody cares? And yet nobody cares? Let me show you an article. Are you ready for this? Many of you guys saw this, but this was from one week ago. Okay, one week ago. China threatens to sail its Navy into Hawaiian waters as U.S. and Australia announced defense pact. Days after flotilla of four Chinese vessels sail past Alaska. Yep, Chinese vessels going past Alaska 
Here's a picture of it. This is a week ago. Let me read it to you. China today threatened to send its Navy into the Hawaiian waters in the last round of saber rattling into the Pacific after Australia and the U.S. and Britain announced a new naval alliance in the region. Four Chinese vessels have already been spotted sailing off the coast of Alaska this week in a display of naval power amid increasing tension as a global nuclear submarine pact was signed to take on Beijing. Isn't it interesting that some of the news that really matters, we're not really getting? Why? Because we can only talk about one thing. One narrative. What's that? It's the discovery, generations ago, that you can control a nation by using its media. A Chinese-guided missile cruiser, guided missile destroyer, general intelligence officer, and an auxiliary vessel were all spotted off the coast of Alaska's Aleutian Island during surveillance operation during the Bering Sea. What do I believe that this is? I believe that this is a modern-day war of the worlds. CIA released the Black Vault over 2 million documents on UFOs doing what? I believe showing China. Look at what we got. This is a, I believe this is a modern day air show where we are using our military to display, and I don't even believe this is our current technology. The stuff that, uh, this is the stuff that they're willing to show us. Watch, you can YouTube the Tic Tac video. You can watch this thing come right out of the water, go into the water using what they call anti-gravity technology because of now what physicists understand that gravity is actually caused by waves similar to sound waves. So if you could manipulate sound waves, you could, in essence, use that same theory, and I'm no physicist, to manipulate gravity waves to have total control of an object and to make it do what wouldn't be possible otherwise. So what do I believe? I believe that UFOs are exactly that. They are unidentified flying objects. And if a portal opens up in the sky, or if you see fire in the sky, most likely that's either of God or it's of Satan. And I pray that you have discernment to know the difference. But if a metal object is flying through the air, I don't think that's probably from hell. I don't think they have aluminum factories in hell. <laughs> if metal objects with LED lights are flying in the air, I don't think that's from another realm. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why this is scary. It's scary because of the advancement of technology. But it's not scary because of supernatural technology. Right. Amen. Amen. And I think we should be able to discern between the two. So I believe that aliens are demons. And I believe that this display that we're seeing on the news is part of. And this is just me. You believe whatever you want. Okay, You, you figure it out. You pray about it. You, you know, I, as you can tell, this is... This is very serious, serious stuff, we, you know. But I believe that what we're seeing right now is actually more of a modern-day war of the world's play on the media to show nations, you better not mess with us. Because oh, this, this entire last year, we are basically in a World War III with Russia and China. But, but the new world war is happening through technology through intimidation, because we, every nation knows that nuclear warfare just isn't an option. That will be the end of us. Now, let me circle back around really quick. When it comes to the supernatural, you have a supernatural God. When it comes to your Bible, it is completely supernatural from beginning 
to end. So when you turn your Christianity into something that isn't supernatural, you just neutered your faith. There's no excuse for powerless Christianity. Now, there's not a lot we can do about U.S. technology. Apparently, it's far more advanced than any of us ever knew. But there is a lot that we can do about aliens, elves, all of these things. And you guys, we have to get the word out. We've got to get the word out that Jesus is alive, that he is good, that the gospel, it means good news, and that the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells within us. Yeah, I'll tell you something. I got good news tonight. And the good news is, we were with Pastor Gail today at the newscomer lunch where she told us a story about a resurrection miracle from just this last week. From just this last week. Yeah, we could talk with Jessica, right, who, uh, with the house that was haunted. So who did they call? They called the SRC Ghostbusters. An entire family received Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And guess what? Their house is no longer haunted. I, I could tell you about my grandpa, who was not a Christian. He was not a good guy. He was not a nice guy. And then one night, my, gra- my, gra- uh, my grandma threatened to leave him, and, uh, and he didn't know what else to do. And somebody invited him to a revival meeting, and he went to the service, and there was an altar call at the end of the service. My grandpa said, I'll do it one day. Then the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, you'll do it now, or you'll do it never. And my grandpa got out and walked to the front of the room, and Jesus Jesus delivered him of smoking and drinking. He went home that night, poured out all of his booze. My grandma uh, wasn't too excited about it. She didn't like him as an alcoholic, but she didn't think she'd like him as a Jesus freak. So she was going to leave him then and she was going to leave him now. And then one night, uh, several nights later, my grandma was crying in her bed as the presence of the Lord came into her room. And she turned over and said, Bob, what must I do to be saved? And he led her to Jesus. Well, people at my grandpa's work, they didn't like the new Bob. They liked the old Bob. And so they decided that they were going to make his life rough. So they would hide his tools so he couldn't find them, so he couldn't get his job done. So he began praying and asking the Lord where his tools were. And the Lord would show him where his tools were. And that's how he developed his word of knowledge ministry. And then my dad, he was born, had no desire to be in ministry. He was at, a, again, a revival meeting where Fuchsia Pickett was ministering. And all of a sudden, an open vision came, and he got to see his future. He got to, God called him into ministry. That night, God healed him of stuttering. And even in the years, just before he died, he would see the angels of God that would come into his hotel room, that would come into his car. They would come as the lightnings of God, and they would form maps on the wall. And he would draw out these maps and he would give them to his friends only to find out that many of these maps were actually islands, remote islands in Indonesia, some of which he would actually travel to in canoes. And my dad was a big guy and he'd be in these little canoes going out into the remote places in Indonesia only to find out that God had already spoken to them and they were waiting for him to come and he would show up in these remote villages. People would get saved and healed and delivered. My, my point is this. Christianity is a supernatural faith. There is a real God and there is a real devil. There are real gateways. And if you have opened up the gateways of your heart through the occult, through astrology, through Ouija boards, I can tell you a story told our youth at youth camp about my cousin who was bullied in, 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 in high school and was always getting picked on. And then he got into, this, uh, uh, he got into uh, Dungeons and Dragons and, and, uh, and all, he started getting really, really good. And he wasn't necessarily an artsy kid, but all of a sudden he started drawing um, elaborate 
demonic type creatures to the point where his hand would move on, on, its, on itself and, and he began creating the most uh, detailed demonic creatures and that was all good. He became, um, I believe he was a dungeon master. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. He, he worked his way up and now all of a sudden he'd go to school and he didn't feel like the nerd anymore because he had identity and he had purpose because he had literally supernatural power that he was beginning to cultivate. And that was all good until all of a sudden these creatures that he, were, that he was creating and drawing and developing began to visit him at night. And that was all good until he would tell them to leave and they wouldn't. Until finally he reached out to my parents. My parents told him, you're going to have to, you're going to have to get rid of that guard. You know, he was, he was terrified. He's being taunted by these demons. And, and they said, uh, and, and as any good Pentecostal would do, you know, what do you do with uh, occultic material? You burn it. <laughs> and so he threw all of his stuff into, the, into this place and he, he lit a match. He threw the match into the fire and the match came out of the fire and it burned his face. These are, these are gateways. These are things that open. We open up gateways and doors and things to the demonic that demons use doors, but so does our king of glory. He comes in through gateways. When you give your life to Jesus, you become a gateway. Christ Jesus is declared as our hope of glory who resides within us. And when you become a believer, you become a temple of divinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come and reside inside of you. You become a new creation reality, or what Paul would call an alien. He would say, you're not from here. You won't stay here. You're just passing through. If I could release a message to my generation, I would say, we're not from here. We've been here thousands of years. And one day, he's coming back. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to get allergic to, rel to religion. It is time for the church of Jesus Christ to develop hives when we know what the outcome or what the end is going to be. How do you know that you're following Jesus? You're always just a little bit nervous because you don't know what you, he's going to ask you to do. If you've always got the outcome planned, then you've, you've hijacked everything and you're the ultimate engineer. And this is what I would say as believers, we've got to allow for Jesus to be our chief architect. We've got to allow him to be the engineer. And we need to allow him to draft up the blueprints that we follow to see his kingdom come and his will be done. Because my ideas are sometimes good. They're better when they're Andrea's ideas. <laughs> but ultimately, my ideas are not going to change the world. Andrea's ideas are not going to change the world. But our God's ideas will change the world, and he can use little people to do really big things. When you read about God's generals and you read about uh, men like John G. Lake, who in Spokane, Washington, saw over 100,000 documented healings, it became the healthiest city in the United States of America. When you look at William Branham, who as he spoke, the glory of God came like a halo over his head and could even be photographed. When you look at these various stories of God's generals like Mariah Woodworth Eder, who went into a trance for days and did did not move and did not need water or food. When you look at God's generals, I say we need generals in our generation. We need ordinary people that say, Holy Spirit, come and possess me. Let me be a true heavenly alien. I pray that when I walk into the room, people freak out and say, what are you? Our God is good. We have good news. He's not mad at you. He loves you. And there are people here tonight, you've been tormented. You've been tormented by demons like fear. You've been tormented by demons like oppression. You've been tormented by things that you don't have any control over. And I'm telling you, tonight is your night for a miracle. Tonight is your night for the light of heaven to come and radically set you free. Some of you, um, I remember just a couple Sunday nights ago, got a word of knowledge about nightmares and night terrors. And a young woman came up to the front 
and we prayed with her, and the Lord totally set her free. Not one more nightmare after that night. Jesus totally set her free and brought peace of mind to her. Whatever you need tonight, it can be found in the blood of Jesus. Whatever you need tonight, it can be found through this great Savior, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't want to just come and touch you. He wants to come and live inside of you so that when you touch others, it is like the finger of Jesus coming and touching others. And let me tell you something. If you're not willing to reach out and to touch somebody, there will be an ET, a counterfeit Savior, willing to reach out and to touch somebody. There is a war to touch. There is a war to reach. There is a war to capture the passion of a generation. And I'm telling you, I am so excited by the militancy that I see in the church of Jesus Christ. Finally, the church is saying, we have the authority to do something about this nonsense. We have the authority to actually raise up our children in the way that they should go. We have the authority to radically revolutionize education. We have the authority to radically revolutionize government. We have the authority to radically revolutionize media. We have the authority to radically revolutionize worship. We have the authority to radically revolutionize the West Coast. We have the authority to radically revolutionize Seattle. We have the authority. You have the authority. I have the authority. We've been given the keys to the kingdom. It's time to arise and shine and let the glory of God come up inside of you. That the lightnings of God would come from your eyes. That the sword of the Lord would come from your mouth. And that you in your weakness, that when you flex, the strong right arm of God would be seen in and through you. I read stories of Gideon who was hiding from the enemy, who was doing something that wasn't rational or even efficient. He was hiding and he was threshing wheat in a low place in a wine press and there in that place the angel of the Lord came to Gideon and said hey you you think you're a coward but I say you're a warrior I say that even when you're hiding and even in the natural it doesn't look like you have anything to give but the Lord said to Gideon I will use you to bring freedom to your generation I read stories of Moses who was disqualified because of murder and he was, he, he was on the run. He was a fugitive. And I read stories where a bush that was on fire and yet not caught his attention. And from the burning bush came the voice of the Lord that says, I know your identity. I know your destiny. And even though you feel disqualified and even though you're a fugitive, I am not done with you yet. I am going to use you to bring freedom to my people who are in bondage. And one of the greatest um, uh, 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 leaders that we see within the scriptures, we see this prophet, we see this Moses, we, we see uh, 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 how the Lord used him. Uh, even, the Lord, even the Lord entrusted to him with, with the backstory. The Lord revealed to him through a vision the genesis and the origin of all of humanity. Can you imagine Moses, the same person that brought deliverance to the people of God, writing down in the beginning, God said, let there be light. If God could use Moses, a fugitive, if God could use Gideon, a coward, God can and will use you if you are willing. Can we stand up to our feet? We started off this service by saying, our God is not intimidated by chaos. Listen, he's not intimidated by your chaos. If you're willing to invite him tonight, he's willing to come in and to hover in your chaos. And I don't know about you, but I really, really need Jesus. I really, really need him, and I really, really want him. And I'll be honest, I need Jesus more tonight than I've ever needed him in my life. And I'll tell you this, our country needs Jesus more tonight than our country's ever needed Jesus. And I'll tell you what, Jesus is not just going to come and show up in the air and lead all men unto himself. No, no, that's our job. He said, go into all the world and make disciples of nations. He's given, this is our task. He, he's, he's commissioned us. 
He's given us a great mission. And it's great. And it's good. And I'll tell you what fear comes to do. Fear comes to rob us of the courage that we're going to need to be obedient and to reveal Jesus. My Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For the Spirit of the Lord does not come to make us timid, but it comes to give us power, love, and a sound mind. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but He's given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. How many of you, you've been walking in a spirit of fear, you've been freaking out, people have been telling you this and telling you that, and you're like, man, I'm so stinking done with fear. I'm so stinking done with the what ifs. Because asking the what ifs and living in this place of paranoia and living in this place of fear, it's costing me my influence. It's costing me the opportunity to reveal the glory of God. I don't care who you are. I don't care what kind of sin you're in tonight. If you're willing to say, Jesus, you be my Savior. Jesus, you be my shepherd. Holy Spirit, you come and fill me. His blood will qualify you. He will come and he will ordain you. And he will do mighty things through you. My God can do mighty things through your weakness. If you're willing to say yes tonight. Can we all bow our heads and close our eyes? And I'm going to ask you a question. My question is this. Would you be willing to confess Jesus the Christ as your God, as your Lord, and as your Savior? And would you do this with the same kind of gravity as you would do as if you were getting married? Would you be willing to say that as of tonight, from this day forward, for richer or poor and sickness and in health, from this day forward, I want to make a vow, I want to make a covenant that I will not do this thing without you, Jesus. Jesus, I'm inviting you into my struggle. I'm inviting you into my sin. I'm inviting you to be my Savior. Without, without anyone looking around, if that's you and you know it's you, I want you to stick and hold your hand up really high so I can see you. God bless 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 you. Hold it up real high so I can see you. Awesome. God bless you. Let's pray together, everyone in the room. Jesus. We believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth that you are king, that you are God, and that you are good. I invite you to be my savior. I invite you to be my good master. I invite you to be the Lord of my past, to be the Lord of my present, and be the Lord of my future. Jesus, would you break the power of sin? Would you close every evil gateway as I open up my gates to only you? No other savior will do. The occult will no longer do. Witchcraft will no longer do. Religion will no longer do. I want only you, King Jesus. Now come and fill me with your spirit. My heart is open. Come and fill me with your spirit right now. O oh, King of glory, come and fill me with your spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, come and fill me up. There he is. 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 All through this room, even right now, people are being healed of stuff in their spine, of stuff in their hips, of stuff even in their blood. Because you were born into something that was not you. And I just see generational curses being broken right now. And the confirmation of this is immediate healing. I want you just to begin moving around your body right now. And if the pain is gone or whatever is different, why don't you just wave at me and let me know that it's gone right now. Just wave at me real, real crazy so I know that you're going. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I want you to run up here. Something's different. 
Something's different in your body. Something's different in your body. Your pain's gone. Something's going on. Wave at me real like wave, wave like a fool. Even if it's wait, yeah. Wave at me and then I can see I, or just get up here. Awesome. Come up here. Come up here. Come up. I know there's more. Yeah, yeah. Come up here, bud. Come up here. We didn't even pray. We didn't even pray for healing. We didn't even pray for healing. But what we're doing is we're we're closing the gates. And when we close the gates, everything evil, everything evil has to go. Hallelujah. You doing good? Oh uh, yeah. What's going on? Okay. <laughs> Isn't this all hold on real quick? We were just talking about UFOs about 15 minutes ago. If you're just joining us online, we were just talking about UFOs, and now Jesus is healing people. Go back and tell your pastor. I'll tell you what the key is. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, so I've had this pain in my butt. <laughs> it's not your husband, I hope. Oh. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> for real? Yeah. All right, well, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for him. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Kim can vouch for this because she has this killer massage thing. <laughs> and I went over at her house last week or something because it was there. Anyway, as you were standing there and you set the hip, and it's it's like a pain in the butt that's, you know, yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I'm moving around, and I don't know if people behind me could see. I'm like doing a little forward stretch. Whoa, thing. whoa, yeah. it just completely yeah, went. gone, going, gone, going, going, gone. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't want to come up here and share about a pain in my butt. No, but. it's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's Listen, true. if you've got a pain in your butt, take that healing right now, even if it's a person. It w All right, I want to pray for your husband. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Just, uh, I'm going to turn off my mic. Stretch out your hands. First in the natural and then in the spirit. Let there be a parallel. We declare your beauty and your glory around her husband, and we bless this covenant. We bless the, their, their covenant that they made before you. And Lord, I pray that you would honor their covenant. Lord, we know that they are one flesh. And now we ask, Lord, Lord, we ask for a one flesh blessing. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you'd bring him right up into his place, right into his role, and right into the understanding. And we rebuke fear right now in Jesus' name. And we declare a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Would you guys declare it over a husband? A spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Do you guys believe that Jesus is going to do this for him? I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. We celebrate you, King Jesus. We celebrate you in advance. And I just declare over you that pain is not coming back. That pain is gone. That pain in the butt is going. Yep, 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 yep. And transformation is coming to your marriage in Jesus' name. Now go rejoicing, sister. Go rejoicing. Hallelujah. Come on, buddy. Dude, Jesus Jesus did something for you. Uh, yeah, uh, half a year I was living on the streets, heard voices in my head, uh, been slouched over all my life and I was looking in the mirror this weekend and I can't even recognize who I am now. I stand up straight, uh, just being delivered and set free every day and I keep just praying to him every day to keep doing a good work in me. And uh, yeah. So proud of you. Thank you. Yeah, so proud. Can I get somebody come stand up behind you? I want to pray for you real quick. Just stretch out your hands. Jesus, just come, Lord. You're going to do something special. He was waving at me tonight. He was saying, me, me, I got, I got something to say. I got something to say. Now, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would just honor his obedience tonight. Honor his obedience. Come and touch. Come and touch right now. Come and touch right now. Come, King Jesus. Touch, 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 touch. Fill, 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 fill right now. Fill, yep, yep. Pray, church. Pray, pray. Fill, fill right now. Fill, 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 fill. More. More, King Jesus, more, more. You're anointing, you're anointing, you're anointing, you're anointing. Now, in Jesus' name, now, in Jesus' name. I break every generational curse in Jesus' name, and I declare you've been grafted into the vine. I declare the blood of Jesus that covers you from the top of your head down to the soles of your feet, and I declare you are a new creation reality. There's no going back, there's just going in. There's just going in. There's just going in. And I actually see the blood of Jesus bringing an, an erasing to uh, traumatic memories in your past. The blood of Jesus erasing the pain from traumatic uh, 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 type abuse. Yeah, and he's just erasing it. And I just, I just declare, you have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. You have the mind of Christ. Now Satan, let him go in Jesus' name. All the way, all the way, all the way, all the way. Let him go. And all the way, all the way. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, and I declare 
Yeah, righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. Whoa, shakara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now everything's going to start changing and you're going to start seeing. I think you're going to be a real seer. In the spirit. You see angels or anything like that? Or? Um, you're in weird stuff, yeah. You see the weird stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And getting ideas and perceptions about people. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. You have the mind of Christ. And I just see heaven opening. And this can be really good. This can be really beautiful. And I love you. I'm so proud of you. Okay, what? Now it's your turn. If you need a miracle tonight, can our prayer ministry team come up here? Now it's your turn. Whatever you need from Jesus tonight, the well is open. His heart is open. Whatever you need tonight, the, the angels of God are in this place tonight. That, that We've talked about evil, and we've talked about demons, and we've talked about darkness, but tonight Jesus wants to show up, and he wants to show off, and he wants to show you how cool he is. He wants to take care of some stuff. Some of you, you've been battling giants for way too long, and I'm I'm telling you tonight, Jesus is about to go five kinds of David against those Goliaths. I see giants falling in this place tonight, and you will no longer be intimidated by those demonic forces and factors. I'm telling you, tonight is your night for a miracle. Tonight is your night for breakthrough. Tonight is your night to have dreams and visions. When? When? Oh, come on, church. When? Tonight is your night for a miracle. Tonight is your night for transformation. And so I bless you in the name of Jesus. I say you are highly blessed. I say you are the head and not the tail. I say tonight is your night. And all the saints of God said amen and amen and amen. Now get your butts up here. Love you guys.